So God, we take this second to say to you, God, that you are great. You are mighty, God. You are powerful, God, and you are greatly to be praised. Center our hearts on you, God.
be our obsession, Jesus. I pray that there would be a hunger and thirst that's unquenchable by things of this world, God, unquenchable by material things or, or, or jobs or, or accolades or titles, God, that we would just hunger and thirst for you and nothing else and no one else, God. to uh, worship through 
one of the songs that she's written at a music contest. They invited her to come and be a part of the top ten. And, uh, it's a pretty cool thing. She's real humble. Won't even say it herself. But uh, be praying for her as that happens. She's flying back to Iowa for it. Um, and uh, we'll be gone through next Sunday. So I uh, just want to let you guys know that. And also, Bruce made some invitation cards. Um, and uh, they're sitting out there at the little booth um, just to use to invite people back to church or invite them here maybe for the first time. Um, there's just a really nice way to hand it to them and then they have the information instead of them hopefully remembering it because I know that I don't remember things and so I figured that would be a uh, nice thing and just thank you Bruce for getting this put together. Um, before I get started, can you just take a moment and pray? God, we just uh, give today to you. Your words would be spoken today, God, that your heart would be conveyed to us, God, that we would walk out of here changed to just people who look more like you, people who act more like you, just from being around you and being with you, Lord, to worship and uh, to your word. And we just thank you so much for what you're going to do here. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, today's value, we're in our series values, and today's value um, comes from one of my favorite wise theologians, Leonard Skinner, and uh, he wrote, be a simple kind of man, go be something you love and understand, be a simple kind of man, oh won't you do that for me son, if you can, right, um, you guys recognize that song, uh, I sure hope so, mm -hmm. my favorite right there, uh, but today's value is simplicity. We're in our series values, and I'm looking, uh, just talking about some of my values for living a Christian life. Uh, because first off, I want you guys to know and understand me um, a little bit. And I want you guys to know how I'm going to lead this church and, and the decisions we're going to make and why I'm doing what I'm doing here. Um, but also, I think that these are important values that you can probably adopt in some ways into your life. Um, so. And please, you know, stick through this series with me. And um, if you have questions ever about my messages or anything I say, please reach out to me. I, it's something we'll talk. It's another one of my values. But uh, I, I want you to understand where I come from, and I want to hear where you are coming from. If you disagree or you don't understand or something, I'd much rather you come and talk to me about it. And I'll even take you out to coffee and pay for it or dinner while we talk about those things. So please reach out to me. But I'm a big fan of keeping things simple, or at least as simple as they can be. Um, a phrase that I learned and I heard a lot in a previous ministry job was to approach everything with a kiss. And kiss stands for keep it simple, stupid. And uh, well, I don't think we need to adopt that phrase, you know, uh, because there's some little issues there. But I think it's a good reminder that we as humans in general like to overcomplicate things. Right? The more people that get involved, the more complicated things tend to become. Because we're trying to take care of everyone's wants and desires, you know, and all those things, things get really complicated. And I believe church, especially in America, is complicated. And we have put a lot of focus on pleasing people and still trying to please God at the same time. And it gets really messy. I believe church was instituted by God to be a simpler concept. And I believe that we need to get back to that in multiple areas. So we're going to look at the definition of the word simple. And we're going to work our way through that definition and see how we can apply it to our lives and how we can apply it to uh, this church. Now the Webster Dictionary has many different parts to the definition of simple, which is kind of ironic, um, but we're going to walk through that together. The first part of the definition is for simple is that it's free from guile or it is innocent. See, the gospel, the good news of Jesus, the reason the church exists today, doesn't need to be spread through, you know, guile or sly or cunning ways. Right? As a church, we should not be looking for sneaky ways to get the gospel into people's lives. And we, we just need to live in such a way that reflects Jesus, and he will draw people to himself. Jesus says in John 12, 32, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to myself. I think that outreaches and mailers and all that stuff is okay and important when done without a hidden desire behind it. We need to be clear with our desires and our intentions. And it should be known by the way that we live 
that if we're handing something to somebody, they probably know that it's probably Christian of some sort because they should see that in our lives. Right? There's no bait and switch ordeals here. We're not even trying to sneak people into a church and then be like, oh, and Jesus. You know, they're coming into a church. They should already know that it's about Jesus. First Thessalonians 4, 11 through 12 says, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. You should mind your own business and work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders so that you will not be dependent on anybody. I love that phrase in there. It says that your daily life would win the respect of others. Does your daily life win the respect of others? The second part of the definition of simple is that it is free from vanity, or it is to be modest. And the example it gives is a simple outfit. As we make changes around here in our building, and in the ministries that we're putting together and building back up, the goal will always be modesty, because modest is hottest, right? <laughs> but seriously, it, it's not about us. It's not about certain ministries. It's not about what these things can look like. Yeah. It's about God, right? But keeping it simple also doesn't mean that we have to be plain Jane, right? It's just not over and above. Yeah, we have colorful lights, and, and we're going to do stage design, and we're going to have some fun things going on around. But our desire is to keep it simple, that it does not take away from God. Because we cannot add to it. And we're not even going to act like we can. Right? To really let God be glorified through our creative elements, we will have things. Because God made us creative beings just as He is. And to ignore creativity is to ignore parts of how He created us. But things can be simple and can be great at the same time. Do you know that simplicity is actually more attractive to your eyes than, you know, complicated things? You know why sometimes you go look at this painting and you're like, why is it worth so much money? It's just like a couple splatters of paint or something, you know? But the reality is the simplicity of things is what really draws our attention. It, but I don't know. It's just sort of crazy thing to me that simplicity draws our attention, but our lives in America are just super chaotic. I mean, just driving down the road, not even just ignore traffic, but think about all the billboards and all the things going on and all the signs. It's just constant things trying to draw your attention, and we just need to simplify there. First Samuel 16, 7 says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks out of the heart. As a church, God is looking at our heart of our church, our values, our, the things that make us who we are, the things that shape what we do, way more than he looks at what we're actually out there doing. I mean, it's important to do, but if we're doing them for the wrong reasons, it doesn't really matter in the first place. We need to become people that are more concerned with our growth, not numerically, but our growth in, in getting deep and getting to know God more, our growth as a church that looks more like Jesus, than the appearance of our building. Now, that doesn't mean that we ignore that our building and let it fall apart, because I believe God is also glorified through good stewardship and creativity. And people should see that we care about our church, but we don't do it to draw people in. Colossians 3.23 says, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Just because we keep things simple or plain Jane does it mean that we don't give God our best. I think sometimes we hear simple, and that means, oh, I get to be lazy. Or I, I get to, to slack off a little bit, because I don't need to spend so much time in it, but it's going to be simple. But we're still called to give our best. If I'm doing something for the church, or for anyone, I don't want to cut corners. I want to give my best, because the attitude of doing it for the Lord, I will do it with all my heart. When God designed the church, he said that it would be our love for each other that would show the world we're Christians. That that would inflict a, inflict a jealousy. That, would, that they would want to be a part of the community that we have. It wasn't overcomplicated things. It wasn't the best audio or fancy white shows or any of those things. It was the simpleness of people who love each other in some great way. The third part of the simple definition is that it's of humble origin or of modest position. The example was a simple farmer. 
See, I don't think the church is supposed to be boastful about anything other than Jesus because of what he's done for us. But a lot of churches, they boast in their growth. The things that they have done, the outreaches they've done in their community, the money that they give, or the amount of people that have been saved or baptized. Now, those are good things. Don't get me wrong. I hope those things are happening here and that we will grow in all those things. But the greatest thing we have as a church is Jesus. Right. And we will never, anything that we have will never go beyond that. And that should remind us to stay humble. When I think about the example the dictionary gave as a simple farmer, what comes to mind is, you know, some small town guy who everybody knows. Um, everybody can rely on him. But you would never hear all the things that he's done for the people come out of his own mouth. Right? Maybe everybody else knows how good of a guy he is and would say something and, and his reputation precedes him, but it doesn't change him. Now, I believe as a church, we should not have to brag about the good things going on. It should be recognized in the community, and our reputation would precede us. I was in a conversation about church health a few years ago, and they said one of the signs of a healthy church is if it was to close down, the community would feel the impact. If there was no impact, then you need to reconsider what your church is doing. Proverbs 27, 1 through 2 says, Don't brag about tomorrow, since you don't know what the day will bring. Let someone else praise you, not your own mouth. A stranger, not your own lips. Jeremiah 9, 23 through 24 says, This is what the Lord says. Don't let the wise boast in their wisdom, or the powerful boast in their power, or the rich boast in their riches. But those who wish to boast should boast in this alone. That they truly know me and understand that I am the Lord who demonstrates unfailing love and who brings justice and righteousness to the earth. And that I delight in these things. I, the Lord, have spoken. You know, what is the best way to advertise to bring new clients to your business? Anybody know the best way to advertise? Word of mouth. Word of mouth right? But, but whose mouth? Yeah, not your own mouth. Other people talking about the things that they've seen, you know, been changed by your business. And I believe that that's kind of what's supposed to happen in the church. That we would be boasting about all the things that God has done, not that we do. And that people's lives will be changed from it, and they will be sharing about what God has done. And that's what grows the church. I believe that God's not done with this church. We have an opportunity to partner with God and see amazing things happen. But before that happens, we need to begin with this humble idea of understanding that it's only God, and it's all for God, and that's it. That anything we have is from God, and that we can boast only in Him alone. The fourth thing of the, the simple definition is that it is sheer and unmixed, not subdivided, but controlled by a single gene. Now, as a church, we need to be people of one vision. Matthew 6, 22, in the King James Version, says, The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. I was looking at verses about singular vision, and this one came up, and I actually ignored it at first, because I was like, this is not what I'm looking for. And, uh, but then the more I dug into the context of this verse, it, it became really fitting. Because the context of this verse is from Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount. You know, he, it's his first sermon, and he's, he's sharing his heart with the people. And the verse before, uh, right before this verse, is actually where Jesus says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And then he mentions this about being of a of single vision, of having, uh, if your eye is being seen. And then following it, he says, in verse 24, that no one can serve two masters, but only one. Right? We are called to be people whose eyes are single, focused on one thing, Jesus. Right? The word single in the Greek can also be translated as simple. Amen. It then reminded me of a verse from Song of Solomon 1.15. And see, the Song of Solomon is a poetic book. And it's kind of an artsy way of describing the relationship between the church, you know, Jesus' body, and Jesus. And in this, uh, there's a verse, verse 15 of chapter 1, it says, How beautiful you are, my darling. How beautiful. Your eyes are like doves, young woman. Now this would be Jesus talking to the church when it comes to things outside of the artsy form. But I think it's interesting, it says your eyes are like doves. Because have you ever looked into the eyes of a dove? 
Like, I'm not really sure that Solomon was giving a compliment. Yeah? Like, if Victoria's eyes were like that, I'd be mostly afraid. You know? and, uh, not like, yeah, well, that, that's what I'm looking for in a woman. You know? Like, but, but there's something actually much deeper about Doug's eyes. See, doves, because of the shape of their head and where their eyes sit, they sit kind of on the side instead of in front. Uh, their vision is better binocular, meaning single vision, than binocular. Like us, we see two things and our brain combines the image into one, but doves only look with one eye or the other, and they have single vision. Do you know that they also can't, you know how we move our eyes around the side of our head? You know, the nice thing about a dove is that they can't roll their eyes actually, because they're fixed. They're stuck where they're at. And so for them to, to look at something, it actually involves turning their whole head, their whole body, to be able to see. Now, isn't that a lot more interesting that, that God has called us to have God's eyes? This single vision where, where we can't turn away without turning everything from Him. And that we would be monocular in the idea of we're only seeing and looking to Him. Now, I believe Jesus was hitting hard on this singular focus thing in Matthew 6. He says, where is your treasure? Because that's where you're going to find your heart. And you can only treasure one thing. What master do you serve? You can't serve more than one master. You can only choose one. And if you want to be full of life, you need to be of single vision. Imagine what a lighthouse would look like if it was actually just a bunch of dim light bulbs all shining all the way around the walls. Like in all directions. Man, what good would that be for someone who's lost in the storm trying to find but that singular bright beam of light that rotates around, I mean, what hope and joy like fills that traveler who's lost, right? That's what we need to be. Without a singular vision, without being of one vision, our light doesn't shine as bright into the world around us. And so we need to be of simple, single vision. Now, I've been really careful prayer since I've been here and since we've known we're moving here in conversations with God about what is his vision for this church? Where is it going to take us in this next you know, few years? And what, what does he envision us be? But in the meantime, there is some simple direction, some simple vision that we can connect to before, I, you know, before God really clarifies things for me to speak. And that's the things that Jesus has already commanded us to do. If we just focus on those things, like loving God and loving others, the greatest commandment, to go and make disciples the Great Commission, and to be witnesses of His power in our lives and to others from Acts 1 8. And that leads us to the fifth part of this definition is that being simple means that it's readily understood or performed, as in simple directions. Now, I believe the church in America has really overcomplicated many of the directions and commands of Jesus. To the point that the body of Christ, and just the, the regular church attenders, the regular people that Jesus would be around, come and they sit in the chairs and pews and they're afraid to act because it feels too hard or complicated. Right? Like if I said, go and disciple someone today, would you go, I don't, I don't know how to do that. I need to find a book. I need to, I need to you know, listen to a few more sermons or messages on these things. I'm not educated enough to do this. Right? That, that's the feeling that I think a lot of people in the church get because we've overcomplicated. And it makes it feel out of reach to people because you're not the expert. I do believe that people in the church want to be the church. Right? Most church outreaches and serving opportunities are fairly well attended because they want to do what's right. And when somebody organizes them and they just need to show up and have their part, it's kind of easy. But we need to better serve people in the church, not by giving them opportunities to do it, but teaching them the simple ways of See, outreach doesn't need to be a huge organized event. It's really as simple as inviting your neighbor over for dinner, or praying with that coworker who's having a hard day, or attending a sporting event with someone who invited you, and letting Jesus shine out of you. I think one of the causes of these problems, especially in America, is that as pastors have become more and more educated, they really have separated themselves from the average attender who comes. And it's not on purpose, you know, it just sounds like, wow. I can't do what they're doing because they've been studying the Bible and they did all these classes and things, so of course it's easy for them, but I, I haven't done those things. 
has accidentally caused the church to become an idol because regular attenders figure out, I, I just can't do what the pastor is doing or those leaders or those things. You know, and it doesn't help that if you go to look up a book on discipleship, there's thousands, right? And you're like, well, if thousands of people have wrote it and I still don't know what I'm doing, then I definitely can't do these things, right? And I feel the exact same way. I'm overwhelmed by the amount of things out there. I'm, I'm the type of person that before I tackle a new project, I, I want to research it my, to my best and fully understand what I'm getting myself into. But, guys, that's not how Jesus taught. And that's not what Jesus expects of us. Jesus has never expected us to become an expert at first. Do you know Paul, uh, the Apostle Paul, he wrote the majority of the New Testament and he was actually a very well-educated man. He used to be a Pharisee, which meant that he went through all of their Bible schools that they had at the time. But he often said, I'm actually choosing to speak in simple and plain language and rely on the Holy Spirit instead. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he actually says it multiple times. Verse 1, it says, When I came, first came to you, dear brothers and sisters, I didn't use lofty words or impressive wisdom to tell you God's secret plan. And then verse 4, it says, In my message and my preaching, we're very plain. Rather than using clever and persuasive speeches, I relied only on the power of the Holy Spirit. In verse 13, it says, when, I tell you, when we tell you these things, we do not use words that come from human wisdom. Instead, we speak words given to us by the Spirit, using Spirit's words to explain spiritual truth. Now, there's a saying that if you really understand something, that you should be able to explain it in a way that a child would understand. Have you ever heard that before? That if you really grasp it, you should be able to get a child to understand it as well. And Jesus grasped everything he was called to do in a way that children could understand. And when he speaks, and when he taught, it's as simple as that. Hector shared a verse this week with the men in the text from Mark 9 about uh, having childlike faith. It reminded me of a quote by C.S. Lewis that says, God has called us to be childlike in heart, but adult-like in intelligence. Uh, Paul from the Bible said it in different ways, says, be as gentle as doves, but still as wise as servants. Now I want to say, I'm not saying we ignore deep theology at this church, okay? I'm not saying, well, let's throw it all out if we don't understand it. You know, we're just going to keep things easy. You know, that, that's not what I'm saying. Because um, I think good understanding of scriptures and Christianity is very important. But there's a, a proverb that actually says, be careful to not be overwise. And I think that there's a time for deeper discussions of our faith and theology. But I think that most of the time we should err on the side of readily understood and performed. If you look at Acts 4 with me, this is Jesus' requirements for being able to do what he's asked us to do. Right? Peter and John were on trial. They healed a man. Okay? They just prayed for this guy and he was healed. And um, they were telling people that he was healed through Jesus' name. And the religious council, they didn't believe in Jesus' resurrection. They didn't believe in Jesus being the Son of God. And so they were really upset about this whole thing. And they brought Peter and John on, on trial, basically, and they asked him, how was this guy healed? And Peter, through the Holy Spirit, spoke a whole sermon through truth that it happened because of Jesus. And this is how the council replied in verses 13 and 14 of Acts chapter 4. It says, the members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. For they, they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in scriptures. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing right there among them, there was nothing the council could say. It's simple. Spend time with Jesus. Obey Jesus. He empowers us through the Holy Spirit to do the work that He's called us to do. Being with Jesus is all we need. The disciples weren't spiritually or scripturally educated people. Did you catch that? And then they were ordinary people. I love that. And literally, that word ordinary is another word for simple. They were just plain people. Jesus taught in a simple way. And this is really the basics of discipleship. When he says, go and make disciples. Jesus said, imitate me. Do what I do. Then he says, do it with me. Then he says, I'll do it with you. You take charge of this one, and I'll, I'll come and support you. Then he says, go and do it. And now teach other people to do the same. And you see this throughout Scripture, John 13, 34. Jesus says, I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other 
Just as I have loved you, so you should love one another. That's another thing. Imitate me. See how I love people? Love me the same. Love others the same. Paul modeled this as well in 1 Corinthians 11. 1. He says that you should imitate me just as I imitate Christ. That's discipleship. Yeah. It's simple. Do what we know Jesus did as he did. Right? When you leave church, we should be encouraging other people to go out, to, to go out and do what we learn. Right? When you leave here, are you putting those things into action? When you run into other people from church, are you saying, hey, how's it going? Are you being simple this week? You know, are you loving other people this week? Right? Are, you, are we encouraging each other in that? That's discipleship. How many of you guys have heard of the game Simon Says? Right? Simon Says, put your hand up. Okay. Uh, see, I knew you guys were The rules to the game is very simple. Right? Simon Says, then you do it. Simon does not say, then you do not. It's a really simple game with really simple rules. Now, life is not that much different. Right? The game is called Jesus Says. It's really not a game. Right? But it's just as simple. Jesus says, and you do. Jesus didn't say it, don't do it. Right? But, but do you do? Right? It, it's simple as that. Jesus said, I've given you everything you need. I, I'm going to take care of it. I, I've empowered you. I've given you every tool and every resource. Your only thing that you need to do is to go and do it. Romans 10, 13-15. Paul's kind of just ranting a little bit here. He says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is the truth that we know. But then he goes on, but How can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why the scriptures say, How beautiful are the feet of messengers who bring good news. And it comes down to the simple thing of going. All of this, the, this simplicity of it is so simple. It, it comes back to what we've been talking about over and over again. It's just obedience to God. And we, we try to add so many things to the gospel. We try to add so many things. We have, you know, all these, these messages and uh, or, uh, you know, steps to doing this and, and, you know, ways to try this and, you know, 10 better ways to increase your church's growth, you know, and, and all this stuff that go out there. And the reality is, is just, if we could just obey what Jesus said, if we could be simple and that we just lift God up and we boast in Him alone, if we could be single and simple in our direction with following God and what He's asked of us, this church will work. You're, you will grow as a person. Yeah. You will see God do amazing things in your life if you can just do it. Right? It, it's not that hard. You ever, like, struggling with your kids, you know, and you're like, come on, it's right there in front of you. You know, like, like my son yesterday, like, hey, you gotta get your shoes on so we can leave. And he's literally sitting on the floor next to his shoes. Next thing I know, he's running around the house without shoes on. And I'm like, what are you doing? You're supposed to get on your shoes. He's like, I don't know where they're at. Right? Was, I'm like, dude, you were sitting next to them. They were like three inches from your feet. You, know, you, you just had to put them on. And I feel like that's how God looks at us all the time. Right? He's like, I just said disciple someone. And now you're like, ah, I don't know what to do. You know? And you're Googling it. And you're going to the bookstore. And, and then you're overwhelmed by all the books. And he's like, I already told you what it is. I try to live like me and teach other people to do the same. That's it. Right? So keep it simple, but not stupid. Right? Let's pray. God, we just said, uh, we thank you that, you know, that you don't expect too much out of us. The expectations that, that we put in ourselves are some some reason, it's just so hard to reach sometimes, God, but that's not what you asked us to do. God, I thank you for the simple gospel, that it's as simple as if we believe, that if we call on your name, we're saved. And that you just want us to put your name out there. 
God, I, I pray that you would just come, that you would encounter us today in new ways, Lord, and, and that you would just show us how simple it was always meant to be. God, that church was just as simple as people getting together to talk about all the good things that you've done, encourage each other, and end up going back out and doing it again. God, I pray that you would just keep us focused on you. And that as we see you doing things, that we would learn from you. And that we don't overcomplicate the things you've asked us to do. That we don't overcomplicate church. That we don't overcomplicate what it means to be a Christian or to look like Jesus. But that we would just do what you've asked us to do. And that we would just boast in you alone. Jesus, I'm excited about what you're going to do here. What you're going to do through our lives, even this week. God, help us to be people that follow what Jesus says. Here and every pray. Amen. Amen. Being productive for Jesus starts with not overcomplicating it, but keeping it simple. So go and be productive for Jesus. And we didn't do offering today, but there's an offering box in the back that we're going to start using from now on. So it's back there if you're looking for that place. Um, otherwise, have a good week. Be blessed.